secret gory life of little Ed Gein was now exposed, and almost as gruesome was the curiosity of a world that had never witnessed such unspeakable crimes. Curiosity seekers would descend on a sleepy farm town that would leave its mark on America's conscience for decades. squalor of the suspect's house, lawmen have found a grisly collection of preserved body parts and human skulls and skeletons. Crime lab investigators are now trying to determine how long this man may have been killing and how many unsolved murders in the area he may have committed. More news on the House of They went in investigating with flashlights. It was pitch black because there was no electricity and no lights. And one of the lawmen felt something bump against his shoulder. He turned, shined his flashlight on it, and indeed, there was Bernice Warden hanging from the rafters, upside down with her head off and gutted like a deer. Investigators were completely stunned and appalled to discover this incredible collection of human body objects. Uh, and among the things they found were, were bowls that had been made from the tops of human skulls. And then they found what looked, looked like trinkets, but it was like a string of, of nipples from breasts, all on a string. They found uh, a shade pole that was made from uh, a set of women's lips. And they had found other body parts there. Then you'd go out into what would be like a living room, and they found furniture, a lampshade that uh, was, was made out of human skin, uh, chairs that were upholstered in human skin. They found face masks. Dean had apparently flayed the skin from the, from the heads of the victims and preserved them and stuffed them with paper and hung them on the wall as decorations. There has been a lot of movies that bore the words based on a true story on their posters. But what if one story, one gruesome tale was so depraved that in fact it inspired a plethora of films. And not just any films. Terrifying movies like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Psycho, and The Silence of the Lambs. Well in fact, one single story did indeed inspire the stories of all of these killers and all three of these movies, and many, many more. It's the story of one man, two confirmed victims, and a never-ending supply of dried human flesh and bones. This is my remastered story of Ed Gein, also known as the Butcher of Plainfield. No one ever claimed that Plainfield, Wisconsin was a small town paradise. In the fall of 1957, it was home to about 700 people. A quiet, hardworking place on the windswept flatlands of central Wisconsin. That all changed over the course of one cold weekend. Saturday, November 16th marked the beginning of an annual Wisconsin ritual. Deer season. In Plainfield, the men hunted not for sport but for food. Their trophies would be killed, hung in barns, and dressed out, gutted, and butchered. Particularly quiet that morning was Bernice Warden's hardware store. Though the store was supposed to be open, the 58-year-old shop owner was nowhere to be found. Bernice's son eventually comes back from deer hunting himself, finding the hardware store in complete disarray with his own mother's blood covering the floor. 
once interviewed by police. Bernice Warden's son mentioned a frequent customer who had been in just the day before to check on the price of antifreeze. Ed Gein, a 51-year-old bachelor who lived in an isolated farmhouse outside of town. That evening, about two hours after Bernice Warden was reported missing, Sheriff Arch Sly headed out with another deputy to Ed Gein's farm. The sheriff wanted to see me in Plainfield. So I came in from Deer Hunt and went to Plainfield and went out to the house with the sheriff. It was dark and we all had flashlights. And uh, the sheriff took the shed. I went into the kitchen and Deputy Fritz went into the living room until the sheriff called that he had found her hanging in the shed. The doors of the house were locked, so the officers decided to take a look inside the wood shed. Once they are inside, they use their flashlights to guide their way through. As they are making their way, one of the deputies is suddenly startled when he bumps into something hanging from the rafters. He quickly turned and shined his flashlight on it and shockingly discovered Bernice Warden's body, dangling, upside down, decapitated, and gutted like a wild animal. Of course, seeing her there with out ahead and cut open like you would a deer. It would make anybody kind of sick, but Deputy Fritz did get sick and went outside and uh, sat in his squad where there was heat, and that made him sicker yet. And he didn't come back in the house after that. Earlier that same day, one of the neighbor boys, Bob Hill, asked Ed for a ride into town, to which Ed obliged. I'll let Bob describe this experience himself. It was getting late, so my folks said, well, Ed was good enough to get to town and we'd invite him in for supper. So we were in the house eating supper that night. Brother-in-law came in from deer hunting and he wanted to know what all the commotion was going on in town. There was a lot of squad cars in town and red lights flashing and that sort of thing. So I asked Ed, I said, well, let's go to town and see what's happening. And he said, well, yeah, that'd be, a, that'd be fine. We got in the car, and he had the car started up and running. And then another car pulled up out in the road, and it was a county squad car. He came over to the car, Ed opened his window, and Dan says, are you Ed Gein? And he says, yeah, and he said, well, I'd like to talk to you. And well, then they took him off to Watoma, right? right then and there, and that was actually the last time that I had ever seen him. Ed Gein was taken into custody that night. As he sat quietly in his cell at the Washara County Jail, police continued to search his woodshed and then cautiously ventured into his home. Inside, they would discover something downright horrific. Bernice Warden's gutted carcass was only Ed Gein's latest grim creation. Ed's house did not have electricity, so officers used flashlights and lanterns to illuminate the scene. As they enter the dilapidated farmhouse, they immediately notice how messy and unorganized it was. Old newspapers, boxes of junk thrown everywhere, well, Gein's entire house was in a state of really unimaginable squalor. It was so completely, completely overwhelmed with the trash of a decade. It was chaos in, in, in terms of, of housekeeping. Well, you don't keep house. It's just it was the kitchen was a jumble. Everything, you know, there was dirty things here and, and newspapers laid up here and, and junk all over the place. But the officers discovered something much more than mere filth. In plain sight, scattered throughout the house, was a ghastly array of human remains. Investigators were completely stunned and appalled to discover this incredible collection of human body objects. Uh, and among the things they found were, were bowls that had been made from the tops of human skulls. And then they found what looked, looked like trinkets, but it was like a string of, of nipples from breasts all on a string. 
They found uh, a shade pole that was made from uh, a set of women's lips. And they had found other body parts there. Then you'd go out into what would be like a living room, and they found furniture, a lampshade that uh, was, was made out of human skin, uh, chairs that were upholstered in human skin. Each disturbing discovery seemed to top the previous one, until finally, one officer came across a brown paper bag. He opened the paper bag and saw a hank of human hair. And as he himself later described it, he said he had no idea what possessed him to do it. But just sort of reflexively, he reached in and pulled this thing out. To his horror, he discovered it was a woman's face. Worse yet, it was someone police recognized, a local bar owner named Mary Hogan, who had gone missing three years before. For 30 hours, the man apparently responsible for this gruesome spectacle sat in his jail cell, refusing to speak with investigators. Finally, they confronted him with Bernice Warden's corpse, and with that, Ed Gein began to come clean. He had requested a slice of apple pie with cheddar cheese, to which the investigators agreed. Investigators suspected there to be several murder victims linked to Gein based on their findings in his house. He was perfectly happy to cooperate with the police. You know, all he asked for was a slice of apple pie with some cheddar cheese on top of it. And according to the investigator, Ed ate the thing. And after that, he told them anything they wanted to know. They said, well, what's all this body? What's all these body parts in here, Ed? You know, how many people did you kill? All the dead stuff in his house. They just assumed that it was a murder victim. But all told, Ed would only confess to two killings, Bernice Warden and Mary Hogan. The rest of his grisly artifacts, he said, were crafted from corpses he had stolen from local cemeteries. Police were not initially inclined to believe Gein's story of grave robbing. Ed Gein told investigators that between 1947 and 1952, he would rob graves from three local cemeteries. He told authorities he made as many as 40 moonlit grave robbing visits while in a daze like state. On some occasions, he woke up from the daze and stopped what he was doing. And oddly enough, he also said he would return some of the bodies after feeling remorse. My dad, he couldn't tell us what had happened. He just said, I want you to come in and watch the news tonight with me. And the news came up on the television. He was the person. I just said to my dad, oh my gosh, that's Ed. We were all upset. We were all devastated. We were horrified about what had happened. It was a terrible, horrible thing. It was just such a complete shock, I guess. It was a, something that was a little bit difficult to talk about. It wasn't just the murder of Bernice Warden that was so disturbing, it was the other terrible things that he did that was upsetting so many people. This is a guy who had been living in their community almost all his life and been a babysitter for their children, had been e eating at their table. Well, look what he did and how he did it. They couldn't believe it. Mashara County Sheriff Art Sheely reportedly assaulted Gein by banging his head and face into a brick wall. As a result, Gein's initial confession was ruled admissible. Sheely died of heart failure at the age of 43 in 1968, right before Gein's trial. Many who knew Sheely said he was traumatized by the horror of Gein's crimes. And this, along with the fear of having to testify, especially about assaulting Gein, caused his death. One of his friends said, he was a victim of Ed Gein as surely as if he had butchered him. On November 25, 1957, police exhumed the caskets of Eleanor Adams and Mabel Everson at the Plainfield Cemetery. Both of the caskets were empty. Above one grave they found a pair of dentures and a wedding ring. This was ultimately enough for police to believe that Gein had been truthful about the grave robbings. To this day, no one really knows how many graves Ed Gein dug up but he was suspected of killing at least four other people. The teenage genitals found in his farmhouse might have belonged to 
Evelyn Hartley, 15, and Georgia Jean Weckler, 8. Hartley disappeared in October of 1953, and Weckler was abducted in May of 1947. Neither crime was ever solved, and the girls' bodies were never found. Here is a complete list of body parts found on the farm. Listener discretion is heavily advised, as this list is graphic. Whole human bones and fragments. A wastebasket made of human skin. Human skin covering several chair seats. Skulls on his bedposts. Female skulls, some with the top sewn off. Bowls made from human skulls. A corset made from a female torso. Skin from the shoulders to waist. Leggings made from human leg skin. Masks made from the skin of female heads. Mary Hogan's face mask in a paper bag. Mary Hogan's skull in a box. Bernice Warden's entire head in a burlap sack. Bernice Warden's heart in a plastic bag in front of Keen's potbelly stove. Nine volve in a shoebox. A young girl's dress and the vulvas of two females judged to have been about 15 years old. A belt made from female human nipples. Four noses. A pair of lips on a window shade drawstring. And a lampshade made from the skin of a human face. A filth and squalor of the suspect's house, lawmen have found a grisly collection of preserved body parts and human skulls and skeletons. Crime lab investigators are now trying to determine how long this man may have been killing and how many unsolved murders in the area he may have committed. The discovery of a mutilated woman's body found in the woodshed of an old farmhouse near Plainfield, Wisconsin. Police from throughout the region are investigating. These artifacts were photographed at the state crime laboratory and then decently disposed of. When interviewed by Wisconsin state crime lab officials, Keaton said he would dress up with the woman's body parts. He would wear a death mask a tan skin shirt including woman's breasts, and a vagina placed over his own genitals, covered by a pair of panties. He would go out in the moonlight and prance in the farmyard in this sick get-up. Hey, what is up y'all? It's Austin here. I really hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And I will be making a part two where I go into the childhood of Ed Gein and I go into very, very deep detail. But yeah, I just wanted to split this episode into two parts because there is literally so much information about Ed Gein. But I tried to write this as best as I could and I really hope you guys enjoyed. And I'll catch you guys next week. Peace out.